How do you actually integrate the PIMCO data director as backend for headless frontend applications? This is the question we are looking into on our video blog today. Please let us know if our video blog could help you. First of all, have fun watching it and thanks for your feedback. Welcome to the fourth workshop about a data director plugin for PIMCore. This time I'd like to show you how you can implement exports with the data director plugin. For this I have prepared this little PDF with our topics today. I li I'd like to export a CSV with custom fields from the PIMCore backend. Um, I will show how you can set up an export in general. Then after that, I'd like to tell you something about um, command query separation and about automatic exports. This is mainly a feature for really fast exports. The third topic today will be how you can access exports via URL, um, because this is important when you want to access the data from another system. And as a fourth topic for today, I'd like to show you how you can use imports and exports with the data director as the backend for headless front-end applications. But let's start with setting up an export for a simple CSV export. For that, I have prepared a PIMCore system with some example data. You see it here in the data objects area, I have some manufacturer objects and this time a bit more than all the last times to show you some effects of exports and also some products and all these objects come from from an importer or got created by an import with the data director i have a manufacturer's import and a products import those are or how they work i have explained in the other workshops and those created all those objects which we now want to, to, create, to export data from. And to export data, we first have to create a data port. We name it export, or I name it export product data. So .csv, for example, to, to show that it will be a CSV file. And this time the source data type will be PIMCore because we want to um, fetch data from the PIMCore data objects and put that to the CSV file. Our target class will be export. This is not really a class, but when you select it here, then, then the bundle knows that you want to create an export and not change anything within PIMCore. The source data class for an export of our export will be kosher product. In the filter condition, you can filter the exports which uh, get used for the for the, you can filter the objects which get used for the export. Um, but for now, we will create an export for all of our product objects. And on this checkbox to run automatically on new data, I will tell you something about in some minutes. When we use the auto create button, then everything gets all the fields from the core shop product class get filled as raw data fields in here and you see it here how exports mainly work um, in this raw data fields we define which fields we want to export from the uh, objects of the source data class so the first four fields here are for pimco system fields id key pass and published and um, all the other fields are um, custom fields from our from our class when you see it here in the classes area there you see name short description sku ean and that's the same here um, the raw data fields work this way um, the field name uh, later on will be our column names in the CSV file or if you have other exports these will be for example for a JSON export these will be the attribute names of the JSON objects and so there's no no real logic involved here you can specify it 
whatever you want. Uh, but the more important thing is this data query selector column. This, uh, or with this expression, you define which data shall be exported into the field, for example, for the name. And this works um, with the getter methods of the of the uh, first of the kosher product class and also for, for relational classes, then for also for the other classes. What you see here, for example, name, uh, when you put name there, this means that you want to get the content of the field name uh, from the from from each object of the core shop or, or which which gets used for the export um, internally this calls the get name method and the whatever gets returned there we could also return uh, we will also be able to access in the export you see it here when i save that we see the example data this is from, from the object above here. That's the name uh, which we want to export and we also see it here. Um, for for uh, scale out data types, this is always only the field name. But if you want to export complex data types like relations or images uh, uh, or assets to be more general, um, then the syntax gets a little bit more extended for example, when we look at the uh, class definition, there we see the field manufacturer. Manufacturer is a many to one relation. And when we look at the automatically created data query selector, then we see that we access manufacturer, then colon, and then another field name. And this means we call the get manufacturer method this returns an object of the class manufacturer. We see that the bottom here allowed class is called manufacturers. And when you assigned a manufacturer object to a product, then the get manufacturer object returns uh, a core shop manufacturer object. But of course you cannot export an object to a CSV file. And for this reason, we can access other fields or methods of the returned object. In this case of the returned manufacturer object, we uh, want to get the ID of this manufacturer object and also, also all those other fields. And you can chain that as long as you want. For example, the manufacturer has an image. Let's look at the core shop manufacturer class. Manufacturer has an image, image is of type image. And as when, when you set an image to the manufacturer object, then you can also, again, um, not export um, the image itself because get image returns an, an object, a PHP object, um, but you can access the single fields of the object, for example, the full path of the image, the thumbnail path of the image or the the asset ID of the assigned image. So you can change that as long as you want. This is how it works for relations where one element is related to the exported object. For data types where you can assign multiple elements to the exported object, for example, for a many to many object relation or for an image gallery, it is a bit more difficult because you do not know the number of elements to be exported beforehand. For this, we have this all helper. Um, this all helper returns an array of all the fields named in the brackets, in the braces. So, um, for a CSV file, this can only be used as a serialized field. But for example, when you have um, multi-dimensional multi export formats like JSON or XML, there you can use this all helper to get a sub-hierarchy um, it's below in the, in, the, in, the opt, in the export tree. So it doesn't apply for our CSV export because we do not know beforehand how many columns we have to reserve because an, an object could have zero to um, 
to n uh, categories assigned. And as we always want the export to have the same structure so that we are able to, to process this export in another application, um, we won't use that in a CSV file for this time. But you can, of course, if, if you unserialize or if you export it serialized in the CSV file and then unserialize afterwards. But I would recommend to use another data format in this case. But what you can do for a CSV file, for example, and maintain this, the, same, um, the same structure of the CSV file is that you could write something like that categories and then use the index as category get categories method returns an array of category objects we can now access all those um, all those items individually so we could um, we could access the first category and then fetch its name for example um, as I do not have any categories assigned yet, um, we do not see anything in the, in the example data. But you could do it uh, this way when you have to um, export a CSV file and you have relations, many-to-many um, uh, -many relations, for example, where you can assign multiple objects to one exported object. There you could export it this way to get always the same, uh, the same output or the same CSV structure afterwards. Uh, whenever there is an error um, by when processing this data query selector, for example, when you call in this time get categories and then um, then uh, the data query selector says that it should take the first element, so index zero this time. Um, but for our objects, get categories returns an empty array, so there isn't any first element. So whenever and whenever there is such an error, then we simply get nothing um, or an empty string to be exact. Uh, we, we export an empty string. So for this reason, um, we catch all those errors. And if there anything goes wrong, then we have an empty string. But those data query flows are even more powerful because you can chain also the PHP functions. For example, when you export the name in this case, and for your application, you want, um, or for the application which uses the export, you want the the name to be upper in uppercase letters. Then you can simply apply uh, scroll to upper uh, function. This is a PHP core function. And then when we press save then we see that the in the example data column that the name now is in uppercase letters so we can chain all those um, data query selectors with php functions and this way you can export data which is actually not inside the data objects but get pro gets processed dynamically with those data query selectors it is also possible to use or to call functions with arguments for example, uh, when currently there is 20 dresses brown, shiver, when we want to replace some, uh, some words, for example, then we could use the SGR replace function, uh, again, separated by a colon. And then to give this function some arguments, you can use the hashtag, which separates the name of the function from the arguments. And then we could repl replace brown by red. And the actual um, uh, value from the previous um, data, or the result from the previous data query selectors is in, uh, can be accessed with this percent, percentage S. Um, that's the same with, as with uh, printf, for example, when you, when you use that in your applications. And then when we look at the example data, then we have 20 dresses, red, shiver me. Before it was brown, uh, it was brown. Now it is red. Show you again, update, now it's red. 
and when I save again, it's brown. You can also use that, for example, to convert numbers or something like that. Uh, when you want, uh, for example, to when you, when you have de uh, decimal numbers and want to exchange the, uh, the decimal separator, uh, for all such things, you can use uh, functions, but uh, function with, functions with arguments. But for um, this is also applicable for fields within PIMCore. For example, when you have localized fields, like the, the name in this case, when we look at the class, then we see that it's actually a localized field. And when we do not enter any, any uh, locale, then the default locale gets used. Um, the default locale from the, from the user, so currently it's English for my user. Um, but we could be more expressive if we would write it this way, then we would also fetch, uh, always fetch the English name, even if the PIMCore user, which is currently logged in, has as default language Italian or German or whatever. So this is a way to be uh, more expressive and this is the same syntax. Um, you separate the, 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 the function which gets used to fetch the data from the arguments via a hashtag. When you want to get even more complex logic, for example, with conditions and loops and all such things, uh, then you can uh, override the, 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 the data object class and um, write an own getter method. For example, when you have um, a, an additional field um, product name in shop, in, in web shop, and as a fallback, this shall use the default name field. Um, for this logic, you would have to check is the, the shop name field filled and if not, take the default name. For such logic and even more complex logic, of course, you could just implement a known uh, getter method inside the overridden class and then this would be available here too. In the near future, you can use also PHP functions here. Um, this, so, so this mainly works the same as we do it for imports, uh, for example, um, with, the, with the attribute root mapping. For example, when we look here, we always have those um, callback functions here, and we are currently working on that also to, to make this available also for exports. So when we specified all those fields we want to export, then we can, as, as, as the same with an import, we can just import or extract the raw data from our import source, which are the PIMCO data objects, to our um, intermediate table. So it works the same as an import. We extract the data from our import source, but this time it's not a CSV file or a JSON file, but the import source are the data objects, and we extract those data to an intermediate table. And the content of this table looks like that. And this is the same as, um, as we, we saw in this preview data, but of course now for all the objects. Now we have to specify um, in which format we want to export. And for that, we are going to the attribute, attribute mapping panel and you see the attribute mapping for export is really simple. You just have this, these two fields, result callback function and result document action. The result callback function is the function which gets used to create the result document. This can be a CSV file, for example, but you can, in fact, generate every document which you want to use. And the result document, uh, result document action, this is the function where you specify what to do with the generated document, which got returned from the result callback function. So this could be, for example, send an email with the, with the result document, um, upload the result document via FTP to another server, um, or send, it to, to send the result document to an API. For example, when you want to do um, exports from PIMCore to, to another marketplace like Amazon or Google Shopping. You can use that for result document actions. And we are currently preparing um, templates for all those uh, use cases. 
But for now, we just need to, um, to output the CSV file to the browser and we have a ready to be ready to be used template for that. So I clicked on this uh, settings um, settings button for the result callback function, and in the template section, there we already have a lot of uh, predefined templates. And currently, we want to use output raw data as CSV. When we select that, we see there is some code here, but we do not have to care about that for now. Uh, we just press save. And that's it. We just have, or we now have set up our uh, CSV export. And when we now go to the history and manual import uh, panel, then we can use this start export with current raw data button, which uses the raw data we just imported. And when we do that, then we see that the CSV file got exported and all the data which we defined to be exported is in here. So when we compare that to our preview panel from the intermediate table, we see that it's actually exactly the same. ID, key, pass, published name, ID, key, pass, published name. And it's exactly the same. And yes, that's all the data. So that's how you could set up uh, an export uh, where you define which field shall be exported, uh, which supports complex data types by using or by chaining those data query selectors and also by, um, by applying PHP functions if you want. And all those data now can be exported. Um, now there may be the case that the that the order is not the way you want it, the order of the of the products or the order of the objects being exported. You can adjust the order by reordering the raw data fields. So if you now, for example, want to uh, order the objects by name, then you can just put it via drag and drop to the top position. And for uh, for objects which have the same name, uh, we want to uh, sort those um, by SKU, for example. So this works the same as um, an order condition or an order expression in SQL. For example, when you have uh, order by name, comma, SKU. So this works the same here. Um, we first sort all um, exported products by the name, or to be exact, by the uppercase name in this case. Um, whatever expression you have in the data query selector. And for all those products with the same value for this first um, field, the, the we sort those by SKU. And you can do that whatever, with whatever levels you want. Uh, you can just put it how you want and that defines the, the order of the export. When we export that again, uh, we now have to do the complete export because the raw data has to be uh, processed again. And we have to wait until all the data gets put into the intermediate table. And there is our file. When we open it now, then we see that the products got now sorted by name and those with the same name got sorted by SKU. Uh, I think so. Yes, six comes before the X. Um, that's how, how you define the sort order of the exported objects. Now there is not only the way to start export with these uh, buttons in the uh, data director uh, panel. But as for imports, this, there's also the possibility to run exports by right clicking the, um, for example, the products folder. And then under export, we see that we can also access or um, access the export from, from this point. So the logic behind this is that 
we or this in the background is checked is there any object of the given source data class below or, or beginning from this point so when we click here we can also export a single item when we do that and open it then we just have exported the single item and this also works for object hierarchies so when you had for example a hierarchy like that and you had a parent element and some uh, child elements and you export the parent element then you would export only the data from the child element so it works the same with a folder then we see that here we now have two items and those are exactly those two which we uh, which we just moved below the parent element. So to summarize how exports work with the data director, I've put some annotations here. Um, the data port name gets used as a download file name. To, to show you that, so what I mean with that is that this name abo above here gets used as the uh, it gets used by default as the download file name. So when we um, Start the export again. Then we see here um, that the name above here is uh, the same name as the data port name. Uh, of course, the white spaces get replaced by those plus signs. Um, yes, that doesn't matter. If you want to adjust that, then you would have to edit this uh, callback function here, and then you could adjust everything. So. Uh, all the logic for generating a CSV file is in this result callback function and of course you do not have to use um, the provided template but you can use uh, uh, you can edit that uh, as you want another important use case is for example this raw data as CSV packed as zip file including reference assets uh, this means that as a result you get the raw data as CSV uh, and this CSV gets zipped into a zip file and all the uh, assets which you exported, the, the, the thumbnails or the um, PDF documents or even original images, all those get also included into the zip file. And I can show you that. Let's just choose it here. And then, then I edit or I put another in, or upload an image here for example any screenshot and now I assign that to the product and look for the do we actually export the image yes we do uh, when we now um, so when we now export this single object Then we see I got the zip file returned, which just got uh, unzipped by, by the operating system. And when we open that, then we see that there is an export file, uh, a CSV file. In that for the image uh, field, now we have my, my screenshot file name. And on the, in parallel in this assets folder, there we see that the file with the same name exists. And this is my actual asset, which I just uploaded. So this means you can now, uh, um, on, the, on the application which processes the export, you can now re re or reference the file name from the CSV file to the actual asset. Um, you can even use this, this feature uh, to export thumbnails. For example, if we just create a thumbnail definition, um, Monochrome, for example, and just um, do a grayscale gray gray scale transformation. So when we now go to the raw data field for the image thumbnail and add the name of the thumbnail uh, definition, which is monochrome, um, I just created this. Um, so what this means is this, the get thumbnail method gets as a parameter the string monochrome. 
Um, of course, you would have to know how this works internally, but we are um, continuously um, improving the autocomplete features. So in, in short time, that would be also possible for with the with the auto suggestion. So I, would, I mean that that it would appear here, but for now you have to just enter that, save. <coughs> And then when we start the export again, then we again get a zip file with the CSV file. And now we have two assets, the PNG, which is the original asset, and our thumbnail, which is the JPEG. And this one is in grayscale. And when we look at the CSV file, Then we see this is the original asset, the PNG file, and the, um, the created thumbnail with the monochrome thumbnail definition is also uh, inside the CSV file. And for this reason, both files are in here. Of course, if you had an application which only wants to use uh, one uh, thumbnail, then of course the original image would not be inside. So when we remove that from here, delete, save, and export again. Then of course there's only the JPEG file, which is the generated thumbnail. So I got a little bit distracted. Let's come back to the summary, how exports work. Uh, the data port name gets used as a download file name, as at least when you use the default templates, which get delivered for the result callback functions. Uh, the raw data field names get used as column headers uh, at least for CSV files, but uh, for JSON exports or XML exports, um, there the objects um, get named by those raw data field names and the export items get ordered by the order of raw data fields. So that's what I've shown. You can just reorder the raw data fields and this also reorders the, the export exported objects. Um, and for complex field types uh, like relations or images or something like that, um, you can use or you can chain those uh, data query selectors and you can also apply PHP functions as I've shown. And I'd like to address a problem which I've probably recognized when I did the first export. Let's, get go, let's go back to the data port panel. And there we see in this history and manual import panel that our complete export needed 38 seconds uh, to extract the raw data from the PIM core data objects. Um, while the second step, um, converting the exported data to a CSV file is rather fast, only needed two seconds. Now, uh, to address this problem, I'd like to tell you first something about um, automatic exports and command query responsibility separation. Command and query responsibility separation means that you separate the command side of your uh, web application and the query side. The command side means every operation which writes data and the query side is every operation which reads data. For example, uh, when you have an e-commerce online site, then the query side would be that you show all your products on the product listing page. Uh, and for that, you have to read the product names and the prices and their images all from the database. And on the command side of your application, there could be, for example, when some customers um, put something in the, the shopping cart or actually um, buy, bought something in the online shop. And the um, the problem with, with a normal web application is that both sites read from the same data model, namely the database tables. And those database tables are by default um, optimized for the for write operations. So everything you do with um, optimization, um, uh, pardon, uh, with normal normalization of your uh, database tables and also for your PIM core data objects, because in the background they create um, 
they create database tables, everything you do for that is optimized for write operations. So for this reason, or, or, or the, the, the cause for this is that when you had a product and some and the category class, then you would never write the data of those in this, into the same table, um, but you would have a product table and the category table and um, reference the, the um, used categories of the product with some IDs. So for this uh, setup, you would have at least two tables and um, yes, and this is optimized for writing because when you want to change the category name, you would only have to edit the, the category the category item on the categories table and then for all products which have this uh, category assigned um, when you query those then you would get the new category name and, and also about the first uh, normal, normal, uh, normal form is about atomic data um, you, you try to save all the data in an atomic form to be able to concatenate or um, join that together, together later on in your web application in any form. But when you read those data, then you have to do the actual uh, concatenation and joining on the uh, read side in the moment where the customer requests the data. And this is not optimal for the query side of your, um, of your application because all this join, joining of tables and concatenating the data to be in the right format which you need in the uh, in the web application to display the data um, all this uh, operate all these operation operations need some time and reduce performance and the uh, one one um, approach to solve this problem is this command query separation where you have the uh, co uh, on the command side you have the pim core data models which stay the single source of truth but from that uh, single source of truth you can generate multiple, multiple read models which then get used as um, in an optimized form uh, for the read side so in this read model you can have um, already prepared data for example you could have uh, html code in that you could already join um, fields which get displayed um, together in the in the application um, and all those you can uh, prepare and as soon as um, an element gets changed on the re uh, on the command side so in the pim core data objects the uh, read models get refreshed or get updated with the new data and whenever then uh, the a customer comes and requests uh, or visitor comes and requests uh, some data then everything is pre uh, is already prepared and we just have to output the uh, data on the query side and without any work to do and this is much faster let's look at how this can be implemented with the data director plugin i've just uh, i, I just uh, switched those, this back to csv file so that we do not have to wait for all those images um, back on this um, data port panel, uh, yes, data port panel, um, there is this little checkbox here, run automatically on new data. And as the tooltip uh, says, this means as soon as an object or an element uh, in, this, uh, in, in PIMCore gets saved uh, of the assigned source data class, then the, uh, the export model gets updated. And when we, when we set this checkbox and start an import, uh, a, com a complete export again, then we'll see that at first there will be no difference. Um, when we did the export previously, it needed 36 seconds. Now let's look how it needs this time. No, it no, needed uh, 38 seconds. And then afterwards, the actual uh, processing of the extracted raw data is quite fast, needed only two seconds in this case. 
Um, but when we now re-execute the same export, I press the start complete but export button again. Now we see that it immediately gets returned. And the reason for that is that we uh, cache the result, um, the result document on the file system. And we use this cache as long as no raw data for our um, export changes. So um, when we now change a data object, for example, let's just take the first one and change the SKU and append underscore one. So when we save that, then in the background, there gets a process running which updates our raw data. So when we now look to our raw data again to this for this first um, item, then we see that the SKU got updated and all the other items stay the same. So by definition, this means that our raw data is always up to date. In fact, it is eventually consistent. This term means that it isn't always up to date, but sometime it will be updated with the um, with the status or the state of the um, PIM core data objects. So uh, for, for most um, applications, this will be quite fast, but when you have a lot of write operations, then it might take some time till the read model get, is, uh, gets updated. But on the advantage side, you get real fast system. Now, when we now execute the complete export again, then we see that there isn't any raw data extraction because we do not need it as by definition the raw data is always up to date and now after one second we get the the updated um, export let me start again to see that the csv file got also updated when we look here <coughs> the sku got updated when i do that again for two here then we see here in the in the uh, history panel that there is this process which extract the raw data for this single item and when I, we now export raw data uh, ex start ex complete export again then we see that the SKU for the first item is now underscore two at the end. So this means you have really fast exports because the uh, raw data always gets prepared as soon as a data object changes. And this is quite clever because when you think about it, it is um, uh, for, for normal web applications, it's quite strange that um, in the moment of the request of the user, um, then all the operation on the on the query side just gets done. Uh, this is quite a bit late and if we can prepare those work and uh, it is much faster as you see. And for normal web applications it is also strange that every user um, has to wait for all this, um, these operations on the read side while with a secure S system you prepare this export once namely as soon as the data, the underlying data changes and then the prepared data gets used for all requests for, for this data. And this feature allows us for some optimizations of exports. For example, in our raw data, we know when the objects got last modified. So this one at the top got modified at 12 o'clock and we as we uh, save the export results on the file system or cache them, cache them on the file system, we can now check if the cached file on the server, um, uh, the cached result document um, is, is newer than the latest changed raw data item. So as long as the, the saved cache, uh, the cache file of the result document is newer than the latest changed raw data item, then we can just output the, uh, the, the, the cached file from the file system. You see that here when I started again, then there isn't even 
an additional entry here because we directly deliver the cached file from the server and there is no other um, operations being done. But when we change uh, some raw data, for example, as we change the SKU for this product, um, now in the background the raw data gets prepared but um, the CSV file now which got cached on the server is not up to date anymore. The CSV file is fr uh, from 12 o'clock I think and we now have a new modification in our raw data and for this reason we can now not use the cached, um, the cached result document file anymore but have to generate it again. And you see that uh, here in this step, uh, this is this only needed one second um, because we had the uh, raw data already prepared. This got done in the background when we saved this object. And now we only have to convert all those uh, data again to the CSV file and this is quite fast. And this is the additional second. And when we now run it again, then there again, this is uh, really fast because it just delivers the file from the system and no no uh, actual work gets done um, fetching data or doing some transformations or whatever. Yes, and we also use the browser cache uh, for further optimization but we come to that when I speak about the next topic. Um, and this is how you can access exports via URL. Um, I've spoken before about the REST API and this gets again applied for our exports. When we go here at the bottom with this REST API documentation button, then we get this overview of all our REST API endpoints and namely those are our, um, uh, com come from our data ports. So when you compare there is three data ports here and three REST, AP uh, REST API endpoints here. Uh, now the, you see that the blue ones are for the exports and the green ones uh, are for the imports. And when we do that, uh, when we look at this one for the export, then we see some parameters. And uh, let me first show you how you can access uh, the export. And then afterwards, I will show you how you can um, edit the the data which gets exported. So when we now press this button, then in the background there is an export running. It's running again because I now use another uh, source definition. I come to that in a minute. Um, for this reason it's now a bit slow. And now it should be done. There it is, and there is our export. And um, if I put that URL into our browser, then we get the same data again. And there it is. Uh, of course, this time it's got uh, it was uh, much faster because the result already got cached. And this works like like you do import you have to provide an API key. Uh, this uh, you can specify on the, on the, on the user, users panel of PIMCore. I've shown that in, in the other workshop for imports. And, and there are some other parameters. Um, you can specify the locale. This is important when you export um, data from localized fields and in your raw data fields definition for example, we had the name. The name is a localized field, so actually you would have to uh, say in which language do you want the name. Um, when we do not um, provide a language, then we can... Uh, uh, so do not provide a language in, the, in, in, in this data query selector. So I, I mean, you can express it here via a parameter. Then, for example, this would extract the English name um, so you see that's the English name but y when you skip that and only say name 
then you can specify the actual locale to be used for this localized field in your um, export locale parameter. For example, you could, um, when you look at our URL again, here there's locale en, and you could, when you want the German names or other uh, localized fields data, then you could just exchange this to locale de, for example. That's locale parameter. Then you can uh, have the uh, then you have the query parameter. The query parameter um, actually got used when I exported um, the data with this um, uh, context menu items here. Um, we uh, can exchange the data, uh, exchange the SQL condition, which gets used for filtering the objects to be exported. So I explained it here that we have here a filter condition. But we can override this, or to be exact, to, we can extend this uh, with some other um, queries or conditions here. For example, when we only want to export um, objects whose keys begin with A, or let me take six, it's not that much, and we can, uh, we can check if it is correct, then we can just put that here press execute again and at the bottom uh, or let me just execute it in the browser so that we can open it in the table calculation and then we see that we only exported um, those objects whose uh, oh no, whose key begins with six so how much do we have uh, six uh, five items and when we look at the pim core that's those five items here. So with this, you can uh, filter uh, the objects to be exported. Then there is the limit parameter. The limit parameter uh, defines the number of, uh, or the maximum number of, um, of, uh, of data sets to be returned. When we, for example, change this to three and leave that uh, query parameter as is, Can execute this in the browser. Then we see that now only the first three got exported. Let me compare that to the other export. Then we see on the SKUs that those are the first three. If we want to export um, uh, some objects and skip uh, the first. Uh, X elements, then we can specify offset. For example, when we set offset one, and when you see at the URL, all those parameters just get appended here. Um, so you do not actually have to use this uh, REST API documentation wizard, but it gets more easy when you do. When we now execute that again, then we see, um, let me check. Um, that we now exported the uh, we exported three elements beginning from the second one so the qb et and apv yes this way you have the opportunity to um, select only those data which you actually want and not uh, previously said that the browser cache gets used uh, for this um, let's just take a url which we used before, which exports some, some more data, and then look at the network panel. When I access this URL, then we see that as a response, there's this uh, HTTP 304 mo not modified. And this is because we already uh, fetched the result before of this URL, and our browser uh, already uh, knows the response. And when it requests Again, then if we check on the server side. Um, the is the or, or the browser sends the the, the timestamp of the version which it has cached uh, along with the request, so that we can in the uh, on the server side check if in the meantime between saving this result document to the browser cache and um, and now uh, any new modify uh, any new data got modified in the raw data 
So as soon as the cache, uh, the browser cache file uh, has not uh, is newer than the latest raw data item, then we can just uh, or we just send HTTP 304, and this means that n n actually nothing has to be downloaded by the server. You see that here, size 256 bytes, and uh, compared to the uh, to the to the um, file which you actually get when you access that this is much uh, much bigger um, but as the file is already on the client we do not have to um, we do not have to um, download that again and this makes it uh, quite faster again uh, even even faster okay so let, let's come back to our uh, PDF again let me just close all the steps so I've shown you how you can access exports via URL um, or namely it's the REST API with GET requests. As the last topic for today, I'd like to show you how you can use the data director as a backend for your headless frontend applications. So when, we sp when I spoke about command and query responsibility separation, I already uh, gave a hint about that because for normal web applications, every write operation actually is an import and every read operation actually is an export. So we do not have to um, look at imports and exports to, to, uh, to, the, connect for the, uh, to the connection between um, some systems, for example, but we can also use the same concept for applications. You see it here. In fact, every operation which changes elements in PIMCore is an import, and every operation which displays data from PIMCore elements can be seen as an export. And for that, I will now use uh, an, add, an, add an additional field to our Kosher product class um, just for our little uh, demo example. Uh, where is it? Kosher product. Just add a new field clicks. To show you what I want to achieve, um, I've just created a little uh, demo application. And in that demo application, you have an input field, and you can, with that input field, you can query some data. Um, but of course, uh, now the, the, the endpoints on the back end do not yet exist. Um, but afterwards, there will appear some data here, and we now will um, provide the back end. Uh, endpoints uh, with the data director. As our PDF says, um, I'd like to create a new data port. This will be responsible for searching the products, so it gets at input the data which I input in this field, and this will be an export. I've prepared it, so I can now import it directly from my uh, exported files. Um, it's this one. This is an, an export data port. Um, as this gets as uh, input, the, the string I just uh, have written in this field. And as an output, it uh, returns some JSON. So, and when we do it now, send this. And we see we have only one Adidas product, but let's see, for Aven, let's search for Avon. There are some more Avon products. And in the background, or let me, let me show you this application, how this works. All the controller is this one. This is quite empty. And the, um, the, the view which belongs to the controller is where the magic happens. Um, we have an HTML file here, which has this uh, text input and this button we just saw, and we have um, an unordered, unordered list for our results. And as soon as I press the submit button, uh, or click the submit button, an um, AJAX request gets done, and the URL for that a AJAX request is the REST endpoint from our um, export data port. So when we look at the REST API documentation again, 
and look about uh, look at the bottom here then we see that uh, no, um, that this part here web service blackbit data director rest export headless and so on um, that's actually our export uh, or the rest api for our uh, rest api endpoint for our export and then there are some parameters like the api key locator query and the uh, the query is the interesting part. I've uh, told you before that this is, uh, or this defines the object which gets get used for the export. And we fill this query with the data which got entered in this uh, input field above here. So you see that here, that is the, con the, 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 the search string which got entered. And we use that for the expression that we, you, uh, we, we search for all objects who have a name which contains this searched um, string. And now when, when this, uh, this response got loaded and returned um, OK, then we now parse uh, it as JSON because this export returns JSON. And for all the returned results, we now create a, a list item and not for all, but for each. For each element, we create a list item, and this list item gets uh, the HTML code, uh, the name of the um, of the uh, found product, and also this clicked field. Um, when we look at our uh, data port, then uh, uh, the raw raw data items of the data port, then we see all those fields. Here is name, here is ID, and here is uh, clicked. And uh, do I actually have created this one? Um, yes, there it is. Um, this clicks field. And in the front end, it looks as, like this. At the front here, this is the, or at the beginning, this is the name of the product. And then at the end, we see clicked uh, zero times. Now, when we continue to look at the, uh, at the front end application, then we see another part um, when we click at one of those created list items, then another request gets sent via Ajax. This time it's a post request and we want uh, or this post request shall increase this uh, clicks field for the click uh, for the clicked product. And for this, we have to create another data port. This time it's an import. Let me copy the name because otherwise the, the URL is wrong in my prepared front end application. And I've also prepared that. Increase counter. Now we can also look at that data port again. Uh, we see that it is an import target class kosher product and import source is JSON. And the only uh, or the only raw data field is the ID because we only need the to find the product and just then increase the counter. We see that in the attribute mapping, the ID gets used as key field to find the object, and then in the clicks field, we just increase the current value of this clicks field by one. So when we now go to back to our application, open the network panel, and click an element, then we see that the post request to our increase counter data port get executed. And when we look at the PIM core, then we see that this also got executed. I just executed it beforehand. This is why there is also another entry. Um, but when we see this is four now, and when we execute it again, this one, then we see that it's now six. So it's the raw data import, and then it's the uh, processing of the raw data. So the, the, the object got updated. When we look at the raw data, uh, which is in the table, then we see that for all those objects, we have um, that all the clicked objects are in our raw data. And when we open the, the objects, then we see that in the clicks field, there is now this one. 
So let me check uh, again if when we click that again, um, which is it? Uh, the seven seven four one. It's this one, and we click that again and look our, at our data port or not look at our data port. Then we see that it now is another item which gets automatically executed because uh, no, not because that. Um, when we refresh that object, then we now see that the click counter is now two. Um, as you probably have seen, or let me let me switch to the code back, uh, which what we just have seen is this um, click event here. When we click one of those list item elements, then a post request to our increase counter data port gets executed, and the data for that is at the bottom here, we just send a JSON, which contains just the ID. So when we look at the, the post request again, then we see that the actual request looks like this. So that's the JSON with the, with the ID of the clicked, uh, clicked object. And to show you this, what I meant beforehand with eventual consistency, um, I've added another another um, refreshing of the page. So when I click this item, you see that the post request and in it, uh, immediately afterwards there's this get request. When we look at the get request, then we see that the clicked counter is still one, although we just clicked again. And this is what I meant with uh, eventual consistency. The object actually has uh, let me check which one this is. Um, just saw the object ID here, 520. Let me open that. Uh, the object now got um, updated to two, but immediately after we clicked, it still was one. We see that at the bottom here. Now, when we now refresh again, then we get this two, but that's what I meant. Um, we we with the with the post request we update the right model, namely the PIM core data objects. But um, as we have implemented this as an asynchronous um, operation, uh, the the read model does um, get updated um, asynchronically. Uh, asynchronically, and for this reason, the uh, the the read model is not. Um, immediately updated. When you want such an application, this is also not, no problem, but then you would have to return um, from the from the uh, from the import, then you could uh, implement a result callback function again and import the updated uh, the updated clicks counter for the changed elements and then you would have an asynchronous ap application as you would know um, for example for, for your normal web applications uh, it's the same when when you have a write operation there as a response the refreshed html document gets returned you could do that the same when you implement the result callback function for the import but i now split split those up and this is the reason why you not see immediately after the click the updated click counter again here i now click the first item uh, immediately afterwards there was this zero and when I, re when I refresh it again then i see that it's one so you see that the data director can not only be used to import data from or to spim core um, for example between systems between applications but it can also used uh, for such front-end applications and for this, of course, this uh, all those speed optimizations are really, um, really helpful. Um, in contrast, when you would implement such REST API endpoints yourself, for example, for a headless um, progressive web app, then you would have to implement all those features like um, the caching and um, the, the 304, uh, returning of 304 if the um, result is already cached on the browser. All those uh, you would have to implement yourself but it gets much easier with the data director and um, there you just have to uh, 
to check this run automatically on new data uh, checkbox and then you're done. Yes, so we do not have to only look at exports um, too narrow, but every operation which writes data to PIMCore is an import and every operation which displays data from PIMCore is an export. Yes, that's it for today. I hope it was useful for you. Um, thanks for listening and I hope that, we, uh, that, you, that you will um, also visit the next video, uh, next tutorial. So thank you for listening and for watching and bye bye. If you got any further questions about mentioned features and configuration options of the PIMCore Data Director, please browse through our YouTube channel. If you do not find answers to your questions there, please feel free to contact our technical support team to hilfe at blackbit.de. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel to remain up to date and thank you for watching.